Okay, so I'm super excited to talk um, today about some specific stories and specific problems that we've encountered. Um, I work for Nick. My name is Aaron Brewster. Uh, we work on CCBX.XFL. Um, okay, go, go. I can manage it. All right, sweet. So I'm talking about some practical considerations during processing of serial crystallographic data. Um, the purpose of my talk is to really describe some of the day-to-day -day problems that we've had to solve and that I believe most people will have to solve when processing their serial crystallographic data during and after a, an experiment. Um, I'm, my intention is to go super deep and to talk really at the detail level, not so much about how ccvx.xfl solves these problems, but about the problems in general and, and how you can approach uh, their solutions. Um, the data set that I'm going to be talking about is one of the data sets from the tutorial. This is a thermolysin data set that we collected at CXI in March of 2014. This was at the end of LCLS run number eight. Um, I'm going to be focusing mostly, not entirely, on a single run. The run was two minutes long. This is run 25. It's in the tutorial. About 14,000 frames. Um, our hit finder found about 3,000 hits on it, where we're defining each hit to be 16 spots that are brighter than 450 ADU. Um, we are able to index about 1,900 of them, and all of the commands that I'm going to be describing are on the are on the tutorial on a subpage of the tutorial specifically about the, L the LB67 thermalysin data set that we used as a calibration standard for the rest of the experiment for the, during that time. This is what one of the images looks like. Um, that's kind of a useless picture, so I'm going to zoom in a bit. Um, what we see are really, really small Brad reflections. Some of them are on the order of the size of a pixel. Uh, but we do see a very clear loon, another loon up here. And one of the interesting features about this data is that we very clearly can see the radial streaking. So the beam centers down here. There's a radial streaking in this direction. I'm going to pan down. Okay, and now there's radial streaking in this direction. Um, another feature about this data that's, that's very clear is this circle that you see right here. Um, we've included this data set in the tutorial because when we collected this data, we applied a, a um, high-low high gain mask to the CS path detector to improve the dynamic range. So at low resolution, this portion of the detector is set into low gain mode so that the pixels won't saturate as easily where here at high resolution, the pixels are set into high gain mode so that the pixels, uh, so that we're able to better detect the weak signal at high resolution. Um, the seam that you see here is due to the fact, the correction that we're applying uniformly to the entire uh, image is not accurate for every ASIC. And that they're, they're, each one of these ASICs has a slightly different gain setting. Um, for this particular ASIC, you, if you trace this the arc of this down through here to this ASIC, you don't see a seam. The correction that we're applying is accurate, but for other ASICs, you can see it. Um, we, we, we don't know how to solve this problem without uh, collecting a flat field image, um, which is beyond my area of expertise. But most, we found that most users don't want to take the time to do that during their experiment. So kind of, we're kind of stuck with this problem at the moment. But we think that it will help us be able to eliminate a lot of the saturation on low resolution. Okay, so that's the data that we're talking about today. Um, as I've been assisting people collect and process their data at LCLS, I've discovered that most people and myself tend to go through a process of about three phases when working on the data at the beamline. And those three phases involve uh, a, a series of time where you're working exclusively on the metrology, trying to really understand where are my pixels in space. Then there seems to always follow a period of discovery where I'm looking at the data, really trying to understand the crystallographic attributes of the data, how they interact with the detector, um, what are my spot finding parameters, what are my unit cell dimensions, and how do I find and optimize these parameters to be able to extract the best integrated signal from my data? Then, 
after the discovery phase has ended, and I think that I really know what my parameters are, then we go into hardcore, serious processing time, where now I'm trying to keep up with the Beamline operator, collecting their data as fast as they can, to be able to give some kind of feedback to the operator saying, hey, you've actually changed over the last couple runs how you were injecting the sample, and it's hurt your data quality. Go back to how you were doing it before, which I really think is the goal of a uh, of the person that is in charge of doing the data processing, be able to get that kind of feedback. So metrology, discovery, and processing, three separate but interconnected phases of working with an XFEL experiment. So let's, let's start focusing on metrology. Uh, Nick already covered a lot about how you optimize the quadrant position and the tile positions. So I'm not going to go into much detail on that. Instead, I'm going to focus on some of the problems that we've seen at CXI, uh, then we, where you need to account for the beam center. This is also true, uh, true at XDP. But also, how you, once you've accounted for all those things, how you also have to take into account some detector distance and wavelength corrections. So let's start with the beam center. So um, the beam center for, in ccdbx.xfel is defined as the center of the CSPAD detector. But we found, re we found over time that the detector rail that the CSPAD rides on is not exactly parallel to the beam. Um, but the consequences of this, as you move the detector from position to position, it shifts side to side. And that effectively changes where the beam is. Um, the shift is really small. It can be on the order of just a few pixels. In order to be able to model this shift, I took the tutorial thermalized and data set. I used those quadrant position parameters that Nick described. And I artificially offset it two pixels to the upper left. And you can see that the effect on the indexing was dramatic. So my first takeaway of my talk is to remember that you need to be very careful and pay attention to your beam center. Look at the average image and make sure that your circle, the concentric circles, are concentric with the center of the, of the, of the image. The next thing I want to talk about is the detector distance. So what do we get out of the XTC stream? We get a number that is called dead Z, and it is not the detector distance. The detector distance is the different distance between the crystal to the detector, and this is the number that we need to be able to actually process the data. But what we get out of the stream is the distance from the detector to the back of the rail, because that's the motor position. The motor moves it back and forth from here. And so what we need to put in our configuration files is something called the detector Z offset, which is the distance from the sample interaction region to the back of the detector rail. And then the detector distance is the sum of these two of these two numbers. So what is this detector Z offset? Well, when you go and you start your experiment, the operator will tell you what the detector Z offset is. And, and generally, it's, it's pretty, close, pretty close to accurate. But in our experience, we find that if we refine this offset, we get better processing results. So in the example that's on the tutorial about this thermalysin data set, if you, we take the initial detector Z offset of 572 millimeters, and then I've hidden the actual commands here because they're gnarly and gorpy, but you can have a quick little command that'll write out new configuration files that changes the detector Z offset from 565 to 580, and then there's a command that submits all of those jobs to the cluster, and then X amount of time goes by and you come back with essentially a chart telling you what the best detector Z offset is. And so this is what I mean by really, I want to talk in detail about what you need to do to get the best out of your data. If you had just taken the 572 number and ran with it, you would have missed out on almost half as many images as you would have been able to index with that data set. 578, as it turns out, is the peak of this, of this, of this chart. Here I'm using number of indexed images as a quantity for measuring success. Now, we consistently use that image, that, that uh, number because it's easy. Um, I'm not arguing that it's the best number for measuring success in terms of data quality, but it's a decent one to get started. Um, sometime, so moving on to the next topic, uh, wavelength corrections. Sometime in 2000, this has been alluded to by the other speakers today. In 2013, the conversion between electron energy and photon energy drifted. Let me explain what I mean by this. 
the number that's in the XTC stream for every shot is actually not the photon energy, it is the electron energy. If you recall how the experiment works, electrons go whizzing by into the LCLS and they get undulated, and then they, bam, you get, uh, you get photons. And this equation here describes how that's done, where you have a, an input gamma, which is related to the, uh, to the electron uh, energy, and then there's other factors in here, including the period of the undulator, and then other undulator uh, um, characteristics are rolled into this factor K. And what we found was that in 2012 and stuff, and, and earlier, it was it was about at, they were about the same. You didn't really have to apply much of a correction beyond what we already knew about. But then it started to drift, and all of a sudden we got different wavelengths at the end than we expected for our images. Um, and so we added this delta K parameter to our processing. Let me tell you what the effect of this is. So this is the same experiment as we, as we were looking at before, but this time I've applied the delta K correction. And you can see that this shift as to where the detector Z offset is correct, effectively changing the distance, has moved because the wavelengths have all changed. Now, coincidentally, for with and without the delta K correction, 578 turns out to be the exact same number um, that you should use to get the best number of the indexed images. But if you didn't apply this delta K correction, all of your unit cell dimensions would be slightly off, either larger or smaller, whichever way it goes. And, and this is real. This actually happened with one of our collaborators where they weren't applying this delta K correction because it was kind of new to us. And not, they couldn't get a molecular replacement solution because their unit cells had all changed. But they went back and added this correction, and then they were able to proceed. So this is applicable if you collect the data in 2013 and you want to process using ccvx.xfl. Um, Chris O'Grady worked or bent over backwards to help us put a fix in recently. Um, we were collaborating with Anton Barty to get this done also, so that everything from the end of run 9 onward into run 10, you shouldn't ever have to worry about this again. Um, but there's a window of time that you should be aware of that this would, that this would affect you. So what are my takeaways on this metrology sec section? In addition to what Nick already described, always look at your average image and verify your beam center is right. Refine your detector Z offset to get the best number of indexed images. And most important is pay real close attention to the unit cell parameters that you're getting from your indexing because they are the best indication that your distance and your wavelength are, ac are accurate. Um, this, is, this does, of course, assume that you know your unit cell parameters, but usually, you're, usually we've been using a calibration sample first that you do know a lot about, so you can use this technique. Okay, now you've gotten that far, and now you're gonna enter this process of discovery where you're looking at your data and trying to figure out what is the best way to process it. What are the best set of parameters that I can use to get integrated signal? Um, so starting from ground zero, you've got your, everything's calibrated, you know where, your where the quadrants and tiles all should be, you know your detector distances, you have a good handle on the wavelength, and yet nothing is indexing. Um, so that's a problem, so you, maybe you can, so we have ways to address that. Once you get a few indexing solutions, you can use software like distal.imageviewer and cxi.index, which I'm gonna go through and talk about to, to get your first initial guesses at spot finding parameters. And once you get things starting to index, well then you can start optimizing your parameters using lots of trials to find the best parameters and maybe even consider some grid searches for some of these parameters. So let's start at the baseline. Um, nothing is indexing. So what you, how do I proceed? So the first thing that we would recommend that you do is run our hit finder, and this is um, our hit finder using two different parameters that we're um, filtering based on the number of spots. You have to have at least 16, or you have to have at least five spots on an image. Um, you can see that this graph, this, the scale here is changing. If you're much more permissive, you're gonna have a lot more noise to look at. If instead you really tighten your restraints on what constitutes a hit, you'll have a lot fewer images to look at. And then you get these images and you start having individual images to try and index outside of the gigantic Piana platform with the cluster and everything. No, I'm gonna look at one image only and try and index this one image. There are a blizzard of parameters that are available when you're working on CFI, uh, uh, on ccdx.xl. Most of them are just 
nicely defined on, on the wiki. You can see them all if you run CXI.parameters. But what I'm going to focus on is, th is three parameters that seem to have a, a disproportionate effect on, the, on your indexing results. And those are distal at minimum spot area, distal at minimum signal height, and distal at minimum spot height. And for the tutorial, we've optimized these parameters and we found that 1, 5, and 10 give good numbers, give good indexing results for this data set. So what are these for? So this little that minimum spot area says we're only going to accept spots that are larger than this area in pixels. Um, and label it, the default for this number is quite a bit larger because on a CCD detector, the reflections tend to be larger in general. XFEL images, we've seen plenty of reflections that are exactly one pixel in size. And that's real signal and we need to be able to process with it. Um, Minimum signal height is the number of sigmas above the background for a pixel to be a signal. And then minimum spot height is after you've assigned which pixels are signal, how bright does the brightest pixel need to be to be even considered a reflection? So what kinds of effects can these parameters have? So here I've ran um, CXI dot, no, sorry. I'm sure I've run distal dot image viewer with some very bad parameters. <laughs> so distal that image viewer lets you set these param these uh, these parameters on the command line, and I've run it on one image uh, with these parameters, and you can see that it's completely bogus. Way too many images. Each red um, spot here on this image is where a spot was predicted to be by the spot finder. If you try to index this run from Thermalison, you get exactly two images indexed back. Um, the, if instead you use these parameters here, 1, 5, and 10, which are the ones from the tutorial, you can start to see, you only even start to see the lumens here. And you can see that this is a diffraction pattern that will probably index. Um, when you do this in practice, don't be too deceived by things that will look like this or things that look like this. These are edge effects. If I really increase the brightness of this picture, you would see that this is right on the edge of one of the ASICs. This is on the edge of one of the ASICs, and we throw away the borders of the ASICs. We don't spot find on them. Now, what would happen if I started playing around with some of these parameters? Uh, just for fun, <laughs> as it were, I decided to change this from 5 to 10, the signal height. What does that look like? Well, the number of images that I indexed went down to 590 from 1923. But on this image, if I, I'm going to switch back and forth between them right here, for example, only a few reflections are changing. So even a very small change in the number of reflections on an image could possibly be dramatic. Now, I don't know on if this was just this image that it was dramatic, maybe on other images it was more dramatic. But regardless, the number of indexed images really change depending on how you change these um, spot finding parameters. So because of this, we think it's really important to spend time optimizing your spot finding parameters. You could do this empirically, like I was just doing, where I was changing one parameter at a time, use distal.imageViewer and cxi.index to visualize the results of the um, indexing, and, uh, and, and just, go until, just go until things are, are working pretty well. Or you can choose to do a more exhaustive systematic grid search. We've only recently started playing with these. Choose n parameters and you test them exhaustively, but this can be time consuming. For example, if I wanted to really thoroughly search these three parameters, I could do a grid where spot area I change from 1 to 5, minimum signal height I change from 1 to 10, spot height I change from n to 10, where n is always at least as big as the minimum signal height. This would add up to take about eight hours, which isn't actually too bad if you set it to go overnight. Um, but it is prohibitive at a synchrotronics at the uh, at the LCLS experiment while you're collecting data. Um, but I have done it. So here, what I have is a collaborator, one of our collaborators' data. These are three different um, essentially runs. So it's the same sample, the same setup, but it's three different. Maybe not the same sample, same prep. Let me put it that way. Uh, but three different times. Um, I had about 90 images for this one, about 180 for both of these. And as I, I gridded on spot area and signal height, spot area and signal height for both of them, and each of them, it turned out that one was a better spot area, but which signal height was better varied from run to run. Um, 
Oliver has done this as well. This is from this image is from Oliver Zeldin, um, and this is a bit dark to see, but the maximum for him was actually at around four, if I remember right, for the spot height and around six for the spot area for his for this particular data set that he was working on. Oliver took it one step further, where he actually started. He didn't fin he didn't actually hadn't finished this analysis when he gave this, this data. But he was merging the data and looking at the CC one half, depending on how you're looking on the spot area and the signal height. And there were peaks around four and six, which which sort of line up to where we were seeing it also for the indexing parameters. So we think that this has a real effect on your data. So how so for the discovery process, what are the takeaways? If you can't index, you set finder to find some images, try to index it. Optimize your spot, your spot area, your signal height, and your spot height, and consider grid searches for good parameters. And um, I want to just take a moment and, and recognize that this isn't a problem that's unique to um, processing Excel data. Um, Iris Young in our lab has been working with XDS on synchrotron data and MOSFILM. And she, is, and, and she started doing similar analysis with the data set from there. She found the same pattern, where as you change these parameters, you definitely see improvements in your indexing results. So I don't really have much to say about it, except I'm, I'm sorry that it exists. <laughs> We're trying to figure out how to solve that problem, but we don't know yet. And so for now, consider these kind of um, searches for good parameters. OK, so what's the best way to process my data? But I'm not keeping track of time, right? OK, I've got two more minutes. What's the best way to process my data? I have my good parameters. Now, I want to be able to process the entire experiment and try to keep up with the operator to provide real-time feedback on indexing rates, real-time monitoring of my completeness and my resolution. And then maybe I'm done later, so I want to go back after the experiment, submit large batches with new parameters maybe even remove the hit finder altogether so that I, I'm trying to index everything, including the noise. Um, what tools are provided by ccdvex.xl to, to do this? Um, this is a real-time monitor that runs during the experiment. We have a, a database, a MySQL database, that's hosted by, by Slack, which we are appreciative of. And our software can log every frame to this database um, based on how many, uh, how, many, how many reflections were on that, frame, what was, if you do an aggregate over a sliding window, what's your average hit rate as time went by during that particular run? So this is divided into four different um, different runs. Um, we can look at the wavelength, and we can see how the wavelength varies. Uh, this is the uh, average wavelength of a, of a, of a, of a seated, uh, not a seated shot, of a, of a, of a XFL pulse. We can, look at, we can monitor the attenuation. We can see where the attenuation changed. And we can monitor the distance. If the distance gets changed during a run, you would know about it. Um, this is very useful. As it, it runs in real time, so as uh, new jobs are submitted to the cluster, they appear here on the right, and old ones fall off. And you can see how you're doing over time, which has been quite useful. Um, but this is really only useful at, at a high level. To really get into the detail, then we want to use um, CXI trial stats, which I want to show. OK, so here I'm logged into Slack. Um, I have it configured to be using a specific experiment that we are working on. We have a command called um, cxi.listdb metadata, which will list for a given experiment. And as Nick was saying, we, we, we classify our trials, our, our processing in trials. So trial 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, this is which runs were associated with that trial. So for this particular experiment, during trials 0, 1, and 2, I was still in the discovery phase. That's why there's a variable number of runs associated with these trials. I would get a better parameter, and so I re resubmitted the entire run data set so far, and I would get a better parameter and resubmit the entire data set so, uh, so far. Then the experiment ended, and I continued processing at home. So trials um, 3, 4, 5, were all of all 39 of the runs, as I, and I was just changing the parameters as I went along. And so 
this is a nice tool to remind myself as to what I was doing as I went along. I also have a spreadsheet which documents for each trial what were the parameters that I was changing. Oops. Okay. So um, there's also a software called CXI Trial Stats. Here, let's uh, make this nicer and prettier. So what this does is it looks at each one of the runs in a specific trial. This is trial number three. It tells me how many hits are in that trial, how many frames total are in that, sorry, how many hits are in that run, how many frames are in that run, um, what was the overall hit rate, how many images I index, and what is the overall indexing rate. Um, and at the very end, it gives me a summary and tells me uh, how many uh, runs we were able to index in total with our indexing rate, our hit rate, how many frames there are in total. Um, for this particular experiment, for trial three, we got about 93,000 uh, frames indexed, which we thought was pretty good, um, but, it was, but it was only a fraction of how many frames that we thought were hits. And after looking at the data, um, we thought that this wasn't good enough. And so what I did was I changed the minimum spot area. I decreased it, saying I will accept more spot. More, I will accept, accept more noise that I used to think was noise. I'm going to say that. So those are actually reflections. And so for trial four, <coughs> the, it uses this different parameter. And now I'm squaring the database and, build, fit, and, uh, and summarizing the results. Um, overall, the indexing rates are quite a bit higher. Um, and I just want to show, uh, this is one of my favorite numbers that I've had when working on this project. For one of the runs here, we had a 41% indexing rate which means that um, essentially every other frame total, not, not, not counting whether or not it was a hit, was an index diffraction pattern. The injection was very, very good for this particular ex experiment. Anyway, the indexing went way up to 20, 22%, 32, 327,000 frames. If you repeat this process searching for second lattices, it pulls out about another, another 25,000 frames. Um, and then finally, we, I, I did it again where I turned off the hit finder completely. The only reason you have a hit finder, um, which Nick has called a miss filter, which, which would be a better term for it, a hit finder throws data away, right? Um, the only reason you have one is because it is computationally expensive to do this work. You could try to index every frame, regardless of whether or not it was noise. For this particular experiment, our hit finder was actually really good. We only got about another 0.2% total um, indexed frames. But further, so the only reason to have it at all would be to really speed up your processing. If your if your hit rate is about 20, about uh, about 50% um, is what it was. You're only you're in, you're indexing about half the images. But for other experiments, we found that taking away the hit finder completely increased the number of frames we had dramatically because, because the, a lot of the frames were so weak anyway that the hit finder was mistakenly flying them away. OK, that's about all I have. Um, the takeaway for, uh, where is it there? Five. OK. There we go. Nope. The takeaway for this particular portion of the talk is um, that don't use PowerPoint sometimes. <laughs> there we go. So when I wrote this takeaway, my, I realized after I had written it that my days at Hewlett Packard had kind of bit me and I'd accidentally written a mission statement. So I'm gonna channel Dogbert here and say that as a data processor, your goal is to keep up with processing as close as real time as possible in order to provide meaningful feedback for beamline operators and sample injection scientists that they can use to change and improve their operations on the fly to the end of improving data quality and completeness, which is something that we've actually been able to do. We've been able to say, hey, change this while they're collecting data 
and they've been able to get better results. So lots of people to acknowledge, including Johan, who's now left our lab, um, new post, new postdoc Tara and Mohammed, and our new grad student Iris and um, everybody else. So thanks. Well, I have many comments, so stop me when I pick too far. Uh, what you're really trying to do in recognizing a hit or a good brain is trying to see is this a real action pattern. When you do this by eye, visually, I can see that because you've got you know, loose, you've got spots of equal intimates, and so on. I don't index it by eye. Uh, I don't put very easily, so I just look at the kind of pattern. So you're not doing that when you're doing that in a computer. So maybe you should write a completely different kind of way of recognizing it. Uh, but when you're looking at circles or loops, you can, you can say, and you're looking at the big things. Uh, so it just take uh, all intensities above a certain value and see whether they fit a circle, not necessarily centered at the origin, not at all, but somewhere. Uh, or do a pattern of all the big spots and see whether uh, there are certain large uh, distances or something more equivalent to what you see by eye than thinking, oh, this is a crystal. Oh, well, we still think of it as a crystal, but we know the kind of pattern this is. Are you, am I making sense? Yeah, this is making a lot of sense. Um, uh, I should comment that we, that we don't threshold, meaning we don't cut images off because yeah, they're yeah, right. right. We do use spot finding, but, the eye but it's different. The sees the black things. Yeah. So it do something like what the eye does. What you do, what we do with our minds, is look at the image. So I, I, I agree completely. Um, we've been talking about this recently in terms of a more research-oriented way of thinking. How do we solve the hit finding problem in general? We got killed by this recently um, at XPP. We had an experiment which had a huge background. And our normal techniques of trying to even see if we had signal at all in the composite images, the maximum projections and the averages, were completely washed out by the background. Um, and so we had to just go through and try to index it completely by faith, just saying index everything, that same, same lines. So the hit finders are hard. The other problem is about grid searching um, we also think that there should be a better way to do it, a better way to do spot finding that isn't dependent on these parameters that are universal across these crystallographic packages. Um, we don't know what that is yet, but we're thinking about it. Shall I go on, or shall I let somebody else? I think I shall defer to that. Does anyone else have a question at the moment? Okay, okay, let's take it, then we'll come back. We'll come back. So for your grid search, I mean, for indexing, you probably don't, don't need to choose one set of boundaries for everything. So you know which one are, which one set are more promising than you index, maybe 900 friends, so let's put them aside and then for the rest of the time to not index. Uh -huh. I mean, you change the change parameter and do it again. And so, so, it so spoilers, um, our, uh, Oliver's going to talk about, oh, about this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, he has a couple slides about this, and I think that the, this approach is, is very interesting. And Art uh, Limov um, has also started trying to do some of this too. Hi. Um, the relationship between wavelength, uh, crystal to detector distance, um, cell dimensions, they're all interrelated. They're all interconnected, yes. And therefore, if you assume too many of these at one time, they're not going to be happy. So maybe you should fix your wavelength. When people do this at a synchrotron, uh, we always believe the people at the synchrotron in line, this is my wavelength. But I often wonder how much systematic error is going with BDD because the cell dimensions are wrong because someone's given the wrong wavelength. But anyway, I think you might be throwing out things that you should be accepting just because you've got inconsistent things. You may be assuming a, a cell dimension, assuming the wavelength, and then, oh, molecular replacement doesn't work because everything is shrunk and doesn't fit your molecular replacement search because the model is uh, you know, by a standard size. Um, I think it's a fair point. Um, we don't refine the wavelength at all in our software. Um, well, how do you know what the wavelength is? We accept oh, it on faith from the um, from the Slack. Like, like we do, LC. That's right. Um, that said, our intention is to use the spectra that is recorded on a shot-by-shot -shot basis. 
And uh, Mohammed Amin in our group has been working on that. Uh, but it gives you the absolute scale, doesn't it? The spectra does. Only if it's referenced to a metal edge. Yes. So we're assuming that the spectra is metal, metal, referenced to a metal edge because um, Chris has told me that it is um, calibrated to zinc. <coughs> Am I wrong? Maybe it wasn't you that said that. Maybe it was. Um, <laughs> oh, it was Jim. It was Jim Welch, actually. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, I talked to him about this. Sorry, can I answer my own question? Sometimes <laughs> you put in the metal. You see it. Oh yes. Yeah. For certain experiments, we've directly measured the wavelength using a physical approach. Um, but that's not always available, especially when beam time is so scarce. Um, okay, thanks.